May 13th, 2011. Thank you very much. I appreciate you all being here. Uh, we have in front of us as part of item one of the agenda, the draft minutes from the May 10th, 2021 meeting. Commissioners, if you could take a look at those and if there are any suggested changes, uh, please, please uh, let me know. I do have one suggested change, and that is looking down towards the, I would say two thirds from the top of the first page where it says discussion and possible vote to place for good government referendum before voters. There's a reference to uh, the uh, legal memoranda that we received from our lawyers, and uh, I'm suggesting that we put and make clear that the 17 page legal opinion is privileged and that the two page summary is a public summary. So, so if that would be my suggestion. Mr. Chair, if I recall the order of how things went down last time, didn't we have the discussion and possible vote on the for good government referendum before we got the presentations from councilmen um, Mendez and Councilman Glover and Mr. Roberts. I think those were flipped. So this five minute presentation, Councilman Mendez, Glover and Jim Roberts, I would just actually um, delete that because we already have a reference to Councilman Mendez and Glover in the council resolution discussion. And we mentioned Mr. Roberts's presentation in the public comment, which is actually how I recall it. So I would just move that we delete the section called five minute presentation. Any further discussion on those two proposed amendments to the minutes? <clears throat> If there's none and if everyone has read them to their satisfaction, the chair will entertain a motion. I'll make a motion that we accept the minutes with the necessary changes. Is there a second? I'll second. We have a motion and a second. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposition? With no opposition, the motion carries. The next item on the agenda is discussion and possible vote on Metro Council Resolution 837. And with that, I'll open the floor up for discussion. I think per we, we can ask our lawyers to speak to that first or we can go forward with comment. I'll leave that up to the, up to the commission. I'd like to hear from our lawyers first and the presentations before we vote. I think at our last meeting, we actually heard from the public after we voted, which has not been the way we've done it in the past. So I'd, I'd like to do it the way we had been done it traditionally, if everyone's okay with that. Yeah. I second that. I have no problem with that. That's satisfactory. Uh, well, with that, uh, Professor Blumstein and Mr. McMullen, I don't know if Mr. McMullen has any comments, but I know Professor Blumstein does. Uh, can you address the uh, 837 resolution, please? Thank, thank you. Mr. Chairman, we were uh, tasked with uh, responding to Commissioner Starling's request for information about withdrawal of signatures. And I don't know if now is a good time to address that, but Mr. McMullen has a report in response to Commissioner Starling's request. And uh, with your indulgence, now might be a good time to do that consistent with our presentation. But if you have is a that, different time, that would suit is, us fine too. Is that satisfactory with the commissioners? Okay, yes, go ahead, proceed. Good evening, uh, good evening Chairman, Commissioners, Austin McMullen. Uh, there was a, a question that uh, Commissioner Starling had at the last meeting regarding the request that had been made to withdraw signatures from the 
for good government petition. Um, and I know that's been a subject of some discussion. Uh, I've done the research on that question and wanted to report back to you. Uh, that may be beneficial to you in, in responding to the requests that you've been getting. Um, <clears throat> at the last meeting, we had some discussion about what we called the default rule, uh, meaning in the absence of any other rule, what is the rule for how to deal with these requests for withdrawal of signature from the petition? And the default rule in Tennessee is that the signatures can only be withdrawn up to the date when the petition is submitted. Um, after the petition is submitted, the signatures cannot be withdrawn. Now, in 1997, the General Assembly passed a bill that allowed signatures to be withdrawn after the petition had been submitted under certain circumstances. But as we know, that, uh, that section of Tennessee code doesn't apply to Metro by its terms. So as a result, um, we're back under the default rule, which is established in a Tennessee Court of Appeals case that once the petition has been submitted, uh, you can't withdraw the signatures anymore. Prior to submission, people can withdraw their signatures uh, but operating under the default rule, the, the requests that have been received after the petition was submitted cannot be honored. Mr. McMullen, do you have the citation for the, to the code for that section um, that doesn't apply to Metro? Yes. It's uh, Tennessee Code Annotated 2-5-151, Part G, as in golf, is the section that has to do with withdrawal of, um, of signatures from petitions. Part L, as in Lima, uh, of that section is the section that says it doesn't apply to Metro. Great, thank you so much for that. You're welcome. Thanks, thanks, I appreciate it. Any, any further questions on the withdrawal issue? If there are no further questions on that issue, Professor Blumstein, can you please address the 837 questions? Thank you, members of the commission, Mr. Chairman. Um, I want to uh, make a general presentation and then set out some options that we think are available to the commission. And uh, what I wanna do is just talk generally about the issues and then about the options. Um, generally, the proposal from the, from the council has many different components to it. Uh, council member Mendez last time uh, uh, expressed an in, uh, a view that uh, there is one broad amendment with many different components, that that was uh, the intent, and, and certainly there's lots of support uh, for that position. Uh, there is also some support in the uh, uh, submission that there are several amendments, not just one amendment with several parts, but several amendments and so while I think that's not as strongly supported, there is some support for that position. But as, as the sponsor, I think Mr. Mendez's position is the one that we probably need to go with. Um, but I think there are some uh, other alternatives if one pers uh, pursued them. The result of the approach is that there is a lumping together of the um, proposed action by the, put forth by the council. Uh, and from our point of view and from our work, our research, and again, we've only had a few days to do this, so I, I'm a little nervous about making too much of a claim on research, because we've looked at other states and we've looked at Tennessee, but we haven't been as comprehensive as we'd like to be. The problem with the approach that uh, Councilman uh, Mendez has uh, outlined and that the council has uh, promoted is that when you lump together all these 
provision, these proposals, seven of them or so, that blurs this notion of political accountability because voters are not able to vote for each individual proposal. It's kind of an all or nothing proposition. And according to cases in the literature that we've looked at, including the Law Review article that Chancellor Lyle cited in her opinion last, last year, that this is, can be confusing, can be misleading, it can be obfuscatory, and it also can lead to what's called log rolling. Uh, log rolling suggests that I'm gonna vote for your bill because I like one part of the seven parts, but if they're all together and I don't have a choice, then I might vote for something that I would prefer not to vote for uh, when they're all bunched together. Uh, and, and when it comes to legislation, I wanna make it clear, not this charter amendment, but the legislation more generally, the Tennessee Constitution requires a bill to contain only one subject, the single subject idea and that's driven by concerns about having multiple subjects in a bill. That there's a concern about confusion, about log rolling, and about political accountability when you go beyond the one subject. So that's one concern that we have. And when you have multiple, and I'm gonna come to this in a minute, when you have multiple subjects uh, and they all have to be summarized for voters, for clarity so the voters know what they're doing, not only do, can the voters not vote for each proposal, but the uh, summary necessarily links them all together. And so uh, there's not a, really a good summary of what each proposal is about because, and it's not anyone's fault, it's just the nature of things. You have to do the summary within 200 words. And when you have a big long seven proposal, uh, 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 set of proposals, um, that becomes pro difficult and problematic in terms of giving information to voters. The second kind of big picture uh, issue or problem comes when there are, as would be the case here, two competing proposals on the same ballot. This enhances the problem with uh, uh, one amendment as being proposed with uh, multiple goals, and there are many different aspects to this uh, charter amendment proposal uh, put before us by Metro Council. Significantly, it, when there are competing proposals, it's important for the voters to be able to compare, to know what proposal A and proposal B is saying, and not mixing apples and oranges, but having a clear delineation of what uh, is in proposal A and what is in proposal B in an apples to apples or oranges to oranges uh, comparison. And when you have them all lumped together, that becomes more difficult. So if you have just one explanation for these seven or eight uh, different segments, that could be confusing. And if there were a single subject, uh, there would be an explanation for each and the voters would be in a position to say, okay, here's how the council proposes to deal with the subject matter of X, and here's how the for good government group proposes to deal with the same thing, and then voters can choose uh, without being confused about what's on the table. So uh, there's a special need in our, in our view for an explanation and for clarification in these circumstances so that voters know what they are voting for and know what they're voting against. Uh, so if the items are clearly in the, uh, on the ballot where they're saying point A is treated one way and point A is treated a different way by the two proposals, that would be, uh, that would be much clearer. Last year, as we've read Chancellor Lau's opinion, one of the criticisms leveled at the for good government proposal is that they had, well, as I said last time, it was a mess. But part of the being a mess was that they were all linked together. Uh, it wasn't clear whether, in, in fact, it, it was questionable 
whether the voters could vote for point one and against point two. They were all linked together, and against the proponent, according to Chancellor Lyle, we were, I was not there, but according to Chancellor Lyle, that he said that it was an all or nothing proposition and that they were all carefully crafted. And she was critical of the inability uh, to, uh, uh, to vote separately. So if the items in the petitions are on the ballot by themselves, as single issue items, that really would facilitate uh, this kind of comparison where you can vote each amendment up or down. This goes to the integrity of the political process. How can voters know what they're voting for, especially when you have competing uh, petitions on the same uh, general subject matter? And it seems to me it's important, and certainly Chancellor Lyle's opinion talks about this, that the guard against the lack of understanding by uh, by voters. So those are two uh, big concerns, and they're part of the general concern of voter integrity, uh, purity of the ballot box, and clarity, uh, and political accountability. The council, so the conclusion then is the council proposals raise serious questions of clarity, of the interrelationship uh, of the competing measures. I'm not sure that there was much in the description that really said, we're doing this uh, or we're undoing this and the for good government proposal would do something else. And we're uh, kind of uh, uh, putting this to the voter for a choice and for a test. So under the circumstances, and, and I'll explain what our thoughts are, uh, we cannot really recommend at this point, I think some of the problems that the commission had with the for good government proposal last year are involved with the proposal coming from the council this year to place it on the ballots, ballot in the absence of clarification. We think it can be clarified, we think it can be remedied, but not it's not in that shape now. And then there's a question of what powers does the commission have to help in the remedying. And we've set out three options uh, that the commission can consider uh, from the less formal to the more formal. Uh, starting with the, what I would call the less formal would be, uh, and, and there may be more options. We're just putting three on the table for the commission to consider. One would be to, to uh, send a letter from the commission informally, withhold action for now, but not reject anything, and say, look, here are some concerns we have uh, it would be a collegial or informal uh, form of dialogue between the commission and the council. Say, look, uh, we have these concerns that I've just explained, and we would encourage you uh, that there's some inkling in your proposal that these were intended to be separate amendments, but that's not how it's been presented to us. But we think separate amendments are a much better uh, uh, option. They are much clearer. They allow for voters to compare uh, the provisions. And uh, I, I hate to be an academic, but when you submit a paper, sometimes you get a revise and resubmit. Uh, and that would be uh, the sum and substance of the letter. We're not turning this down. We're not gonna act on it, uh, but you would really save yourself some problems, you save some confrontation, an adversarial relationship if you could uh, revise and resubmit. And by the way, while you're thinking about it, you might also uh, th rethink the question whether this goes on the ballot, uh, whether it self-destructs under the circumstances. It would give the council a chance to revisit that question. But there should be an opportunity to say yes or no to the individual uh, proposals. And uh, there should be a better summary of the proposals that talks about not just what the proposal is, but how it compares and contrasts with the proposal being put forward in the competing uh, ballot measure. So uh, this is essentially what happened last time with the for good government proposal. It was not informal, it was not courteous. Uh, they were told they couldn't have their ballot on the, uh, their proposal on the ballot because Chancellor Lyle found it to be too confusing, too unclear, did not track any particular uh, charter or amendment. And uh, she s 
struck it down and enjoined it, and ultimately the for good government, instead of appealing, uh, went back and redid the proposal uh, and followed that format so that each of the six items in the current proposal can be voted up or down, and they're short enough that they don't need a ballot, uh, a ballot summary. The council has different rules. They would have to do a ballot summary, and they should do a ballot summary. Uh, so that's essentially uh, what happened last time, but through a different route, is that they were sent back to redo their work, and they did it. So that's one option, is to send a letter to the council saying, here are some concerns we have. We don't want to take action precipitously. We want to act in a collegial manner, uh, and we want you to have a chance to cure or remedy these concerns that we have before we take action on this. And by the way, if you want to uh, uh, withdraw this notion that there has to be uh, 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 only consideration on the same ballot, you can do that too. In other words, you can re redo these proposals. So that's one option. The second option, or a second option, uh, focuses upon, and I think I've circulated, uh, I, I may have given away, what, well, I think I have a copy. I have it here. To an interpretation, thanks, Dick, of Section 1901 of the Charter. And <clears throat> the Charter, Section 1901, says that an amendment or amendments may be proposed so it sets out the idea that an amendment or amendments may be proposed. And although it's not the only reason reading, we think a good reading and the better reading of that provision is like, why would you need a language that is an amendment or amendments if you could have one omnibus <coughs> amendment as in the Metro uh, 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 Council proposal that covers everything. You, you don't need the language amendments because one amendment would be good enough for everything. So we think amendment or amendments is, there's a reasonable interpretation of that, which would be that it would define an amendment to be a single issue related to a single charter provision so that you don't have one amendment that amends charter provision one, charter provision two, charter provision three, seven different provisions in one amendment. You don't need the language amendment or amendments uh, if you can have this one omnibus provision. The amendments language suggests that the uh, council can do what we're suggesting. It can have different amendments at the same time on considered by the commission. There's no restriction, but they would be in essence single issue requirements. And we think there's a fair reading of the uh, 1901 that would lead the commission to that conclusion and we think ultimately there are strong policy reasons for the reasons I've suggested that that is a preferred reading. It allows uh, for votes on the specific amendments, single issue amendments and uh, it allows for clarity, for accountability, lack of confusion, it uh, eliminates log rolling and we think the interpretation is consistent with and basically supports this general consti Tennessee constitutional provision that uh, calls for legislation on, on a single subject. So uh, I don't want to say it's free from ambiguity. I don't want to overstate that. I think it's a permissible, it's a better reading, but I don't want to say it's clear cut. I think that that would overstate the position. I think it's a reasonable interpretation, and it's an interpretation that has a lot of merit to it for the reasons that I've described, and it's compatible with these broader principles that I've just described. So then the question is, what, what can the commission do with that interpretation? That an amendment means an amendment of a single charter provision, but that the council can have multiple amendments all at the same time on the same ballot, but they have to be discrete and separated uh, amendments. So there are two different, within this, there are two different options. Uh, we have strongly suggested the limits of the commission's authority, and we stand by that. 
But as Chancellor Lyle said, every rule has some minor or narrow exceptions. And I think it would be defensible and reasonable if the commission wanted to interpret 1901 in the way I've just suggested on its own without judicial intervention. The reason is that the case law says that the commission cannot uh, look at the substantive constitutionality of a provision or legality in my opinion and that's what the subject of our earlier memo was. So in general the commission doesn't have authority to engage in what courts do which is interpret the constitution or the general law of Tennessee. But we think a fair interpretation comes from the uh, the commissioner's authority to evaluate the validity and verify the validity of signatures. So there are certain things that the commission can do. It can determine whether the signatures are valid. In another case uh, called the Pemberton case, uh, the court said the commission can determine the residency of a candidate who must be a resident of the jurisdiction and the, the uh, commission has authority to make that determination. So you have these kind of two polar, two kind of decision points. And we've emphasized the first one, the city of Memphis, which uh, suggests that courts can make decisions that the commissions don't. But we think, and we're not recommending this, but I'm saying we think it can be defensible, that the commission could say that this is a different type of decision. This looks more like uh, a decision about how 1901 is interpreted, it's the founding provision of the Metro Charter. It is the basis by which the council can submit its proposal. And uh, we think that that could fall within the power of the commission to uh, uh, determine. And if that were there, then it would basically, instead of deferring action on the, on the council resolution, it would turn back the resolution on grounds that doesn't satisfy the terms of 1901 and urge the council to redo and come up with a kind of an amendment by amendment uh, set of amendments that would then be available for voters to vote up or down and the explanation would then uh, allow for cross comparison between the for good government proposal and, uh, and, the, uh, uh, and the council proposal. The other alternative, and this is our third option, is that the commission could conclude that our general recommendation, which is that the commission has only limited authority to make these interpretations, that that limited authority applies here too. And then the commission would be back in the position it was in last year, and it would say, okay, we're not gonna send it back to the council, but we're going to send it to the court. And as we've said before, the court has authority to determine these things in ways that the commission may not. And so that type of um, uh, declaratory judgment going to a court, perhaps in conjunction with, and we're gonna talk about how the commission has been sued, but in conjunction with these pending cases might be a way to adjudicate. I think from the council's point of view, it doesn't give the council a chance to redo. Uh, it kind of shoots the, shoots the dice, so to speak, as to what a court would say. We would be in a position of saying, we're concerned about the, well, we mean the commission, would be in a position of expressing to a court the concerns that we think we'd rather express to the council in a, in a kind of a, uh, a dialogue to allow the council to, in a sense, fix its product uh, and submit something to us that would, to the commission that would be easier for the commission to approve. But if it goes through a declaratory judgment process, then we would be in a position, the, com the lawyers for the commission would be in a position of having to uh, explain our position, why we think it was not approvable at the present time, but why it had to go to a court for interpretation. Now, so those are three different alternatives that we were putting forward. The last one being the most aggressive where you're in a court and then there's kind of an adversarial uh, relationship um, and it puts the commission and the lawyers for the commission in a position of being adversarial to the council. 
uh, and I think that's not necessary at this point if we pursue that. Now, in the alternative, again, there can be a combination of the letter and the dialogue and uh, declaratory judgment. There are a lot of different ways to spin, to, 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 to spin that, but we wanted to present these three different alternatives, three different options, and our explanation of what they are. And I'll be glad to respond uh, to questions. Uh, Mr. Chairman, if you think that this is adequately laying the groundwork for our thought process. I'm, I'm satisfied that you've done a great job laying this out, and I appreciate it. I know the commissioners may have questions. I've, I've got some questions, but let me defer to the other commissioners uh, to, to so, so they can ask you some questions. I, I have a question. Yes, um, Commissioner. In the uh, resolution, Section 8, <clears throat> they lay out to the extent any portion or provision of this amendment is declared to be invalid, unconstitutional by any court of competent jurisdiction, such portion of provision shall be severed and shall not affect the validity of the remaining provisions in the amendment. Could you use that as justification to go back to the council to say split them all out? Well, I, I think this is section eight that you're referring to mm -hmm. of the charter resolution. Uh, yeah, I think that that language is aimed at a court. If it's declared invalid, unconstitutional, unenforceable, that would have to be by, by any court of competent jurisdiction. But we could certainly strengthen our position for the first option, the letter option, by saying, let's not go there. Let's not split anything out. Let's not invalidate. But let's try to find a common ground where these proposals can be explained to the voters. They can go on the ballot, but they have to be fixed up a little bit in the way we've just described, and they have to be separated so the voters can choose uh, without this log rolling or confusion that we've, we've talked about. But I think that would strengthen uh, the argument, certainly. But I wouldn't rely in totally on that because that's aimed at a, at a court of law. But certainly that would, and, and I didn't go through uh, the details on this, but, but if, if the commission wishes, I have in a uh, kind of a, I don't know what you, you would call it, a, a, a talking points uh, memo uh, prepared uh, examples, and maybe this would be a time to do that. I didn't want to burden the members, but basically uh, Councilman, Council Member Mendez said there's a single uh, amendment here, and that was his position. And I think that's a very sustainable position. I don't disagree with that. I think reading the proposal in the way he suggests is perfectly reasonable, and I think it's very sustainable. But always, on the other hand, at the same time, there are some suggestions that the proposal is for more than a single amendment. The introductory paragraph, if you look at the introductory paragraph of the, uh, uh, Commissioner Evans, if you look at the introductory paragraph of the uh, of the uh, council uh, vote, um, and I'll get I'll get to it. But if you look at the introductory paragraph, and I think that Commissioner Hertzberg was mentioning this at the last meeting, talks about a, a brief description of each amendment, and that suggests that there's more than one amendment. Uh, and, and she she kind of flagged that issue last time, and. The same paragraph states that a brief description of each amendment be placed upon the ballot. Uh, and so that suggests that, again, a brief description of each amendment suggests that there's more than one amendment. Um, th that suggests that there are several amendments. Section one of the council's resolution, if you drop down a little bit, Commissioner Evans, talks about pursuant to this blah, 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 the proposed amendments to the charter. And that suggests that really it's not one amendment, but there's more than one amendment. And so I think it, it's not unreasonable to say that the, uh, there's an alternative interpretation, but we had the drafter before us, and I think his interpretation is reasonable too. So I don't want to get crosswise with Councilman Mendez in this regard. I think his, uh, his uh, approach is uh, is sustainable under the terms, but I think an alternative approach is sustainable. And I think if we were to send a letter, uh, we could reference the 
uh, severability provisions, but we could also reference these, these terms that talk about amendments rather than a single amendment uh, and say, look, let's just clarify this. Let's, let's all come together, maybe write something different. And, and frankly, while you're at it, get rid of the, of the language that uh, basically uh, self-destructs if they're not on the same ballot uh, so that the council would have a chance to have its amendment voted on. Uh, and, and just let me say in conclusion, that you know, there is concern about getting them on the same ballot. It, it, certainly, I understand that. If there is a dis decision to get them on the same ballot, they have to be clear and they have to refer to each other. But let me also say that uh, the position advocated by the council will in fact be on the ballot, whether it's approved by us or through a court, by this commissioner of the court. Namely, we've approved, if it's on the ballot, uh, it, we've approved the for good government proposal, or the count the commission has, and the answer, to, if you don't like what there is there, is to vote no. I mean, the commission hasn't said that the proposal is the law. What it said is the proposal is to be submitted to the voters, and I'm guessing if there's a vote, there'll be a hotly contested vote. There'll be lots of uh, uh, kind of political action going on, pro and con, and uh, so, you know, even if this is, if the council's proposal is not on the ballot at any given time, its concept will be on the ballot. It's called N.O. And uh, it's two, two words. Uh, and, and it can be for some things, like might maybe no on taxes, but yes on recall, and no on recall, maybe yes on leases. I mean, there, there can be a whole series of permutations and combinations, but that would be in the political arena where the petition requirement of 1901 suggests it should be in the hands of the voters. I, it's a long-winded response, Commissioner, but I've tried to be responsive to your question. No, thank you. I, and I was going to have a follow-up question on just that. If, if the six amendments on the for good government are separated and you vote yes or no on those and, and a voter votes no all the way across the board, then it doesn't seem like it's confusing enough to have them both on the, on the ballot. but. Um, if you vote no across the board, then I'm not sure what the resolution difference makes. That yeah, well, I think that, again, um, in, in terms of practicality now, I'm not talking about strict legality, but in terms of practicality, the clearest um, decision for voters is to have a proposal and then an opportunity to say yes or no, or a set of proposals and say yes or no. So. But I think we owe it to the council, the commission owes it to the council to, to uh, uh, kind of um, deal with the hand that's being dealt. And there is no provision in Tennessee law that we could find that bars these competing provisions. But there is a provision that says there must be clarity. And so the the commission has authority to do that. The commission also has authority, and I'm not going to push this point, but I just think it's self-evidently true. The commission has the authority to set the time under state law for the uh, referendum to be held. And so it could exercise its discretion not to put them on the same ballot. And I think that the council has tied its hands and has made that a difficult choice because that has the effect of not allowing the ballot to go forward. But the council can amend its position. That's why I like the letter, the dialogue, and it gives the council a chance to go forward. There are some cases from other states, and I don't want to get into this about here, and I'm, I, I want to make it clear I'm not uh, speaking about the council here, but there are some other states where there are these competing ballots where, and a court in Florida, and I, I must say that uh, Mr. McMullen and his colleagues came up with this case, so I don't want to steal his, his thunder here. He found this case. It's a short case, uh, and that basically uh, says, look, it looks like this was designed, the second set of alternatives, looks like didn't refer to the first set of alternatives. It looks like it was designed to obfuscate, not to clarify, and, uh, and the court was not happy with that and, and uh, wouldn't put up with it. So. Uh, you know, I've thought a lot about why we have this competing set of proposals, but what I come up with is not 
determinative. That we have not been able to find anything in Tennessee law that prohibits that. So I think the council is within its authority to do that, but it's only within its authority to do that if it is clear, if there's some cross comparison. Uh, and I think the best way to do that is to have an apples to apples comparison. But there is, and Chancellor Lyle talked about this, the purity of the ballot, the integrity of the process is really important. And the commission, uh, uh, through this declaratory, uh, through this uh, court proceeding that we have, uh, is, is really uh, promoting that. And my goal in making the first suggestion was to try and get the council to kind of, in a sense, put the kibosh, technical legal term, on the uh, claim, on the assertion that that Florida court was making, that this is really designed to confuse rather than to clarify. And if the, if the council came back and said, okay, we see your point, we're gonna set these up as separate alternatives, uh, compare them, and then let the voters vote clearly what they're doing, I think that would negate any uh, cynical view that this is designed for obfuscation rather than clarification. Is that, is that yeah. response? Yeah. Anyone else have questions? I, I have some questions if that's okay, Mr. Chair. Um, what was the name of the case that you were referring to in Florida, the short one? Do you have that? I'm not trying to put you on the spot, so if it takes you a we little have, while to find it, that's that. okay. I, Okay, great, I would appreciate that. Um, I, I just have a couple of questions. I think I'm just a, a tiny bit confused and I wanna make sure that I understand um, what's in front of us, but is your understanding, Professor Blumstein, that the For Good Government petition will have multiple options for people to vote yes or no? So if people wanna vote yes on, I think you said no on recall and yes on leases, is that your understanding yes, of how it is? Yes, that's my understanding of what the commission has approved and how it will go forward on the ballot, yes. Is to have six, six separate. And that's how it's been right. characterized by the proponents, just as um, Council Member Mendez said, this is just one. Uh, the petition from For Good Government has six separate, what they call separate proposals. So they're all distinct and quite uh, different. Uh, and it, I think the voters can vote no on tax, on the tax changes and yes on recall. And those are all separate, and, but there's not a need for a separate under the uh, state law, which governs the 1901 does not require when a petition is out there that there be separate description. It does for council, but not for petition. Um, and uh, state law only requires a summary if, if the proposal itself is more than 300 words. And I believe the answer is that none of them, well, we were gonna have someone count the words, but I think none of the uh, proposals put forward by for good government is more than 300 words and when I looked at those proposals I haven't studied it carefully for this meeting uh, we did not see that there would be confusion uh, in terms of a voter that they knew pretty much what's there just the way they would for any legislation it's not perfectly drafted but we think that any of the ambiguity this is going to come up in the litigation but we think any of the ambiguity can be handled in the administration of the law I guess um, I, I guess my question is, and how did you come to the understanding that it would be six different check yes or no boxes for for each of those provisions in the four? That's the way it was petition? presented and submitted to the to the uh, to the commission. Did you separate. have a discussion with someone who explained to you that that would be separate votes? No, I think that's when we pr when we discussed that with the commission. That's how that was our understanding of how it was being presented. Okay, I, I guess that's because it was on one petition, and so as a person who voted on it. <laughs> My understanding is it would be up or down, yes or no, um, that it was not that separate was last, petitions. in last year's proposal, but not this year's proposal. Okay, and could you maybe show me, can someone, maybe you, Mr. McMullen, show me where it is that it would indicate that in the petition that it's six separate votes for yes or no? Yeah, I'm not sure. I mean, it could just be that I missed it and I, I, I missed that point. Um, yeah. But it seems to be when you're talking about apples yeah. to apples and oranges to oranges. Can, I can, Commissioner, I can yeah. show, show that to you. It says sure. in yeah. the petition, it says the undersigned Davidson County voters propose the following six separate amendments to the Metropolitan Charter. 
Right, but it doesn't say that they would vote yes or no on each of the six separate amendments, did it? Well, Does I think it if it's a separate amendment, it, it follows a for sure that it, there's a separate vote on it. That's, that's our point, is that an amendment is an amendment of a specific charter provision, and there has to be a vote A or nay on those. That's different from what it was last year. Okay, but wouldn't that be then the same position for the council resolution, which has the also separate sections of, of the charter that are being amended? Well, it would, now. I mean, uh, wouldn't that be uh, the assumption? I, I just wanna be clear. So for making the assumption from the language in the petition that there's gonna be six different votes on up or down, would that not be the same assumption from the council resolution that it's gonna be six separate votes up or down, for example? Well, again, I'm not sure that we, that the commission has the authority to redo that. We were told this one amendment uh, and that uh, was what we were going on. Uh, Councilman Mendez made it clear in his presentation that it was intended to be one amendment with six different or seven different components to it. You, and so could, could an amendment being of a particular charter provision, so that's why we see them as different. If the council wants to, that's exactly what our letter would be designed to do, is to say, if you really intend this to be so separate amendments and you wanna vote on them, just redo this, kind of uh, resubmit it and we can go from there. Well, so, and, and to get to your letter option, which, which I really appreciate, that's something that we've discussed in this commission multiple times, that when people do a petition and they circulate it and they come to us, we don't say, hey, we think this is defective in form for the following reasons, please go back and fix it. Um, that's a discussion that we've had in multiple meetings and something I think they can do in other counties, but we can't do it here, it's not required under state law. Um, and so when we've had that discussion specifically in reference to for good government, when they had the first petition and we said, gosh, we just wish we could have helped them out here and help them clarify the language so it, it would have met with the requirements to put it on. When it came back, the question was, did they get to look at anybody? Did they get to talk to anybody to get advice on how to make that petition fit within the form parameters that we could put it on the ballot? So this commission had made a decision and the advice that we'd received is that that would be invading really the province of the judiciary to be saying, hey, we think this is good or bad or giving legal advice perhaps on you should do this or you should do that. And I think we had quite a lengthy discussion about the fact that this body didn't feel like it was appropriate for us to be able to do that. So I'm a bit perplexed why now we would wade into telling Metro Council what we think they could or couldn't do in order to get what Metro Legal has provided us a memo on they say is perfectly in line with the law and appropriate to, to go on no, with Commissioner, ballot. in response, again, the first option that I put on the table, I made it clear was not a legally binding letter. It was, we're going to stay our hand. We're gonna have a cordial communication with you. We're not gonna act. And we are encouraging you to put that in the format. The problem with just doing it for the, by the commission and ultimately if this goes to court, the court might be in a position to do what you're suggesting. The problem is that Metro w has provided, or the council has provided a 200, 200 word or 190 some word uh, summary of the entire amend of the entire seven amendments under uh, our reading of where each one would be voted on separately. There would have to be a summary and a better summary of each provision, that separate summary is not required for petitions, it is required for council resolutions. So I guess, you know, and more generally, I guess kind of my, my point here is, I, and I understand the hair splitting that, you know, that's going on, that this is what's required by a council, you know, a council resolution, and this is what's, you know, required by a petition, and I get that, and, you know, we're lawyers, not everybody in the room is lawyers, but we're lawyers, and so I understand the distinctions of law and fact there, but I'm having, I think, just a difficult time even as a lawyer, putting a certain standard and a certain interpretation when we're dealing with one um, petition, the referendum that's come to us, and a separate standard and, and set of rules and opinions when it comes to something that's coming to us from Metro Council. It seems to me when you say it should be apples to apples and oranges to oranges, that should be right, but it seems like we're applying you know, an apple standard to apples and an orange standard to, you know, the other apples. Well, I have to disagree with you, Commissioner, for this reason. Um, I think that the For Good Government Group did what we are objecting to in last year's proposal. As we've said in our memorandum, 
uh, we think the for good government group, the uh, petitioner, uh, learned from Chancellor Lyle's opinion and uh, came in with a new proposal. Now, if you read the Tennessean, it's not clear that there's a new proposal, but there is a new proposal, and we think it's, and the commission thought that it was sufficiently different than the other proposal. And so I don't think that there's any differential in approach. The approach that Metro Consul is facing is the approach the commission had to the petition last year from the For Good Government Group. This year, they went to school, uh, they learned from their mistakes, they had a mess last year, they cleaned up the mess this year, and the, the, the commission responded to the cleaner version, and I think the more clarified version. I think we want, I, the, the whole, the point of that initial letter option was not to mandate that, is not to say we're gonna take any action or not, but to stay the hand of the commission pending a short uh, response by the council, and in fact giving them the opportunity that the four good government group didn't have last year, they had to go and lose in court before they got that option, and they took the option, and the commission accepted the renewed option that these are separate amendments, and therefore if they're separate amendments, they have to be voted on separately. So in your letter, in your letter proposal, if we were to reach out and give an informal letter to council, or, you know, sounds like you would also advocate that we do this with petitioners that are circulating a referendum. Um, An informal opinion. You mean in, the, in some future, in the future, in the future in case? In the future, yes, Professor. Um, well, I just think council is a special body. It ha it's a, in a sense, a, it's a governmental unit. And I think there's some case for deference there. Uh, there is uh, obviously strong feeling on the part of uh, the legal director and the members of the council that they want to have their views heard. And so I think there's reason to, to defer to the council, whether I would advocate that this be a generic one, I'd need a little more time to think on. I think there are special circumstances here that warrant special consideration for the council, which is the spirit in which this is offered. Uh, and also to avoid this kind of death by inaction. If the commission doesn't act uh, under the terms of the charters uh, of the council's own provision, it self-destructs. I mean, and I'm definitely, and I don't mean to interrupt you, I'm definitely not for the, the death by inaction. I guess I, my concern about reaching out and trying to just have some sort of a collegial discussion with council about that is I'm not really sure practically how that would work. Would um, it, would the administrator of elections have that conversation and author that letter? Would it be done by the chair? Would it be done by you? Would we have to vote on it? What if there was a three-two vote on how it is that we felt that the, they, the letter should be sent or the advice that it would be in it? In addition, we've already been sued by Metro government and by the National Business Coalition about this, these very issues. So reaching out to have some dialogue or give advice about what it is we think they should do just seems like that would entangle us in a process that's already in litigation. Um, and, and I can't even imagine how you would untangle that from a, from a litigation perspective. Well, but I, I, I understand your position and I've been an advocate of being able to reach out and have constructive conversations with folks if there's issues that need to be fixed. Yeah. I just have one more question. Can I just respond to, sure, to, your, sure. to your last comment? You asked how we envision it happening and we don't have every I dotted and every T crossed, but this is the general concept that we're putting forward. And that is that co-counsel and I, under the authorization of the commission, if it chose to go this path, would draft a letter to uh, General Cooper, Director Cooper, as lawyer for Metro. And we haven't thought through whether we would copy Vice Mayor Shulman or not, because he's kind of the leader of the council, but it would get to him one way or the other. We, uh, we, we would certainly be sure of that. And say, look, this is an opportunity. Uh, we're not gonna act, we're staying our hand as a commission. There's no timetable that we're governed by. We're gonna stay our hand for a reasonable period of time. If you don't wanna take advantage of this option, just let us know and we'll, we'll go forward. And, and, and we'll figure out what to do at that point. There is a lawsuit that's pending, whether to add this to the lawsuit, uh, we can do at that time. But if we wanna avoid getting embraced in litigation and becoming adversarial, 
let us know. And uh, it doesn't require a lot on your part. It just requires doing what, uh, what some language suggests. I don't want to be a gotcha guy, but some language suggests that that's what really is intended. But we were told that the weight of authority is no, that's not what was intended. A single amendment was what it is intended. But go back and make it multiple amendments, allow for an A or nay vote on each one the way uh, the for good government proposal will be structured. And, um, uh, and then send it back and we've given you our hints. And if you respond to our concerns, uh, it'll be a lot easier for us to approve that. Well, going and forward. I guess that's my last question. So if we needed to vote on the council, I mean, my understanding was today would be the last day that we could vote on, on the council, at least from our last meeting, the date that I was given was we had this meeting today because today was the last day that we could vote to put the council resolution on the ballot for the same date as the for good government um, special election. Is, does that remain true? Is everyone in agreement that, that, to, that today is the last date in order to make that happen to meet that election date? So then the blow up provision would automatically happen if we don't vote to put it on today, as you called it. Is, is that right? Well, as I said, I think it may be difficult to have them on the same ballot. I, I, we haven't but, but worked that's, but I'm, I'm, and I, I don't mean to yeah, interrupt yeah, you. No. I don't mean to interrupt you, Professor Blumstein. Um, but I, I just want to be very clear that my understanding is the reason that we set this meeting today is because we set a July election date for the for good government petition. And that is a special election being called just for people to be able to vote on that petition. And that the Metro government um, council resolution says that it wants to be placed on the same date and there has it has been given to us in sufficient time for that to happen but if we were to do it we would have to vote today to make those two run along is that correct yes and, and uh, my first statement my recommend my uh, re overall overarching recommendation is that the, the Commission should not approve that at this meeting to go on the ballot for the reasons I've explained, okay. but to try to mitigate that. And, and, and as I said, uh, the, you know, the council's interest is it seems to be in voting down the for good government proposal and it's, uh, Metro is challenging it in court. And then there's a political process in which it can be voted down. So there's two different options that are still available. But but Professor Blumstein, I don't think we're supposed to take into account the political ramifications and what people are trying to do politically. So I guess I'm trying to figure out why that's supposed to factor into to what it is that we're doing here. I'm just asking as a matter of form and date, is today the last date that we could vote in order to get the council resolution put on as the, as the for good government petition special election? That is correct? Okay, I don't, I don't have any more questions. Thanks so much for your time. Thank you. I have some questions, but are there any other commissioners who have questions? Okay. Professor Blumstein, um, let me ask you this. Um, uh, if we went to court, the court would have, I mean, I, we are in court. I think that's very clear. Um, we, we're already in court. Metro has sued us. Uh, and of course, we hope that it'll be uh, uh, as cordial as litigation can be, but we have been sued. Uh, and um, but in the context of a lawsuit, the court would have the ability to make decisions about what's on the ballot and when things are put on the ballot. Now, we may contest that with Metro, but the court would have more authority than we would have to say, let's, let's say we, we do file a declaration as a counterclaim in the litigation that's brought against us, and we take the position that it needs to be clarified. This all needs to be clarified. We raise all the issues that you've raised. I expect that the city council will raise issues on its side and they will insist that it be placed on the ballot at the same time as the good for government petition. Uh, and wouldn't it then be before the court and it could make a decision based on the competing arguments of the parties, whether to put it on the ballot on that date, even if it's over the commission's objections. Well, this is a public meeting, Mr. Chairman, and I'm certainly not gonna answer 
what could be a litigation issue. So I'll ask, answer it in the abstract rather than yes. in specific. Sure. But in the abstract, a court has greater authority than the commission under principles of equity. Uh, and a court exercising its equitable authority has more authority and more power than the commission does. And that's all I, think sure. that's all I, I feel comfortable saying. Sure, I appreciate that. Um, and I, I, but whether I, or not the court would or should exercise it in this particular case is something that we want to reserve as, right. as, litiga as litigation. That's more of the um, uh, adversarial right. issue, I think. And that's what I'm trying to avoid and, and, is that adversarial right. aspect. And we might argue against the court making that decision to put it on the ballot. But at least that issue is preserved the issue is preserved. In other words, Metro, to, to respond to, uh, to Commissioner Hertzfeld's concern that today's the last day and that, you know, if, if we don't act today, then we've backdoored the decision. If, if we filed a declaratory judgment action, if we gave you instructions today to, to file a counterclaim as a declaratory judgment action, is there at least a reasonable chance that that will preserve the issue for Metro and for us to argue over it, uh, argue over this point of, of whether the, the uh, provi 837 provision can be put on the ballot? If the this case time? were going to court, the court has greater authority than the commission okay. does. Right. But let me just sure. say that the interest of the council in its amendments, as I read those amendments, you know, you say this, I say that. Right. And uh, uh, the saying this or that is available. It's available through a court process, and it will be available through the voting process. So, in fact, if it turns out that uh, Metro Council wants to vote against the for good government aspect, or some of them or all of them, uh, then it will do that. If its amendment goes forward and it's on the ballot, then the voters would only have an up or down on all of them. And, and that's what we're trying to avoid rather than on each individual uh, proposal. And, and that's certainly how I would think that, uh, that the, uh, the uh, um, AOE would, uh, would structure the balance the way I've described, if, it, if, if the commission can hold the election that it's authorized. So, I mean, that side of the argument will be right. heard right. either in court or in the political realm of the vote, right? I mean, let's be uh, candid. What, what, what is being gained in substantive terms by having another opportunity to say yes or no when you already have the opportunity to say yes or no, except that it's all lumped together, which is problematic? But, but going back to the issue of whether we send a letter or whether we raise these same issues in the context of the litigation that we're already in is is there anything legal that there's any legal part of this that would that would prevent us from if we file a, a counterclaim and seek a declaration from raising this same issue from requesting metro either in litigation or in a resolution today, for instance, requesting that they reconsider and redraft what they've done, uh, but that in the meantime, we're gonna seek a declaration from the court since it is the last, the, since it is, you know, we've been put in a timing crunch, basically. And, and I, at this point, I don't wanna get into whose fault that is, but we, we are in a, in, in a timing crunch. Is, is there anything legal that would prevent us from raising the same issues, even if we did file a declaratory judgment action? I don't see, any, I don't see any, anything that would prevent the commission from asserting its claims or from allowing right. Metro to assert its claims. Uh, I think we would be in a position of opposing uh, sure. a court's exercise of that authority. And I just, again, I, I don't want to beat this to death, but uh, it's just wrong to think of this as well, it, will this issue be on the ballot or will it not be on the ballot? Uh, it will be on the ballot. It's Understood. called voting no on the proposal that's before people. It'll be in the hands of the voters. So the, the negative position 
will be there. That will not be there is this one size fits all, a or nay on everything, without uh, clarification that a vote for that position would be equivalent to undoing uh, not just one, but all six of the proposals being put forth on the petition. So I, I, I'm just, you know, I just want to reiterate that it's not a situation where that point of view, that perspective will be frozen mm -hmm. out. Mm -hmm. It will be there. It'll be there in court, currently right. in the litigation, and it will be there in the political realm where it should be, in my opinion, to, to allow people to vote on that. And it's very easy to say no. Right. And if you say no to all six of those proposals, then they don't get enacted. And I'm guessing that there'll be a robust political uh, right. uh, contest or battle, if you will, uh, on, on that question. But I, I just want to say that I don't accept the characterization that not having both amendments on the ballot at the same time means that one perspective will not be, no, I, will not be represented. No, I, I, I absolutely, I understand that. Now, the, the last time we were here as a commission, we made a decision and then we were sued the next morning twice. <laughs> uh, and there's nothing we do today almost any option we take, whether we send a letter or not send a letter, whether we approve, disapprove, it's it's also quite likely that we're going to be sued twice tomorrow or maybe the day after or maybe Monday. Is, would would you agree with that? So, I mean, there's, there's nothing we can do today that's going to keep Metro from amending the lawsuit they've already filed against us or uh, amending or the, yeah, the, if, that business group from doing the same thing. Yeah, if that were the only issue then I would recommend non-action at this point by the commission because I think a lawsuit would be premature until yeah. there's some action. But uh, if the commission wants to go forward and act in one, one of the two ways I've suggested, uh, then uh, I think there may be a, a, a motion to amend the complaint to, to deal with these issues. So if the commission says, we're not going to put this on the ballot right now, but we're going to file a declaratory judgment action, or we're going to exercise what I, I think is, you know, potential. I, I, it's not open and shut, but potential authority under 1901 to to decline on on the grounds that this uh, uh, lumping together doesn't fit with the amendment or amendments language of 1901. Uh, that um, uh, and the commission votes to not put it on, that's a more aggressive, a little more aggressive stance uh, than just writing a letter. Uh, at that point, I think if the commission takes that position then it's ripe for another lawsuit, I think that's correct. But, and, and wouldn't it be at least potentially a compromise measure uh, in view of the, the, the two polar uh, issues in Tennessee, whether we're either quasi-judicial or we're purely ministerial, to do as we did last year with the for good government position because I think this body as a whole agreed with you, generally speaking, that there were serious problems with it and it was perhaps a mess. If, if we as a body decided that there were significant problems with uh, Metro Resolution 837, we could do the same thing, especially since we've already, we're already in court, Metro has already sued us, we just file a counterclaim raising similar issues with the 837 that we raised last year with the good for government. Right. Uh, the only recommendation that I, we're making that I've articulated is that there not be flat out approval for the ballot at this meeting. I don't see how that can be done, really. Beyond that, the three options have different pro permutations and combinations and different attributes, different pros and cons. Mm -hmm. I think the pathway you're suggesting, which is to go for a declaratory judgment, is one of the options that I set out. That is a, a viable option. It's one that the commission used last year. Mm -hmm. And there are certain benefits to that, to put it all in court and put everything together in court. There are certain benefits. At the same time, uh, there are certain, in terms of long-term uh, benefits uh, of ter in terms of conciliation with the council, I think there are certain virtues in uh, having a dialogue with the council and saying, look, here's what we think is a problem. 
if you do this again, don't send us something that is all jumbled together, disaggregate them. It doesn't, in my view, I, I mean, I'm not representing the council here, but I think it's how many times you, you file a resolution and the resolution can file lots of different amendments. Um, so I don't think the council is compromised or disadvantaged by disaggregating uh, these things. Um, whether or not uh, the commission chooses in addition to saying not now, but let's put this into the hands or the jurisdiction authority of the court, that's a, that's a call, that judgment call that you all have to make. We carefully did not make a recommendation as to any of these three alternatives. Um, and I think that they will uh, invoke different levels of, 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 of legal response. The first alternative, since it's not a decision, I think will not invoke legal uh, recourse, at least not immediately. I think it, we would certainly be able to defend that that's premature. But uh, that also gives the council the benefit of being able to redo this and uh, time it in such a way that if the for good government proposal passes, and that's certainly not a sure thing, or portions of it pass, the council would be in a position to respond to that and say, we just did some things, we made a terrible mistake from their point of view, and let's have a vote to undo that, uh, that mistake. I mean, that, th that would be part of the scenario, but uh, could the, count, the commission seek a declaratory judgment the way it did last year? Chancellor Lyle said the answer to that is yes, I think that's co the correct answer. I think the commission can do that. I'm not opposing that. I'm just saying that's one of the options. And there are pros. I've tried to map out the pros and cons. Sure. And you've mapped out the pros, but there are also some cons to going that way. And there are more pros, in my view, in some ways, about it, seeking the letter. But can you combine them in some way? Maybe you can. Okay. And I, I, I have some concerns that are basically sending this back to Metro and asking them to redo it might not be fondly received by Metro and that if that's done, it might be better for us to do it within the confines of the protection of the Chancery Court. That's, that's kind of my just, that, that's not a question to you, but that's kind of a statement. Uh, but that, that I think is a, you know, a concern that I have, especially since they've just sued us in the last couple of days, uh, so we're already there. No so, um, is, are there any other questions from from the commissioners? I don't have any other questions. Are we to the discuss portion of the day? Uh, I'm comfortable with that. Anybody? Um, I, I, I didn't hear. I, I, the suggestion has been made that it's now the time for the commission to start discussing among ourselves what we want to do, and and I think it is. If so, if, well, if, yes. I'll start. Um, I think we've had a, a whole lot of discussion over the course of I don't know how many meetings and how many hours, um, receiving how many hours and single space pages of legal advice, which I'm, I'm very appreciative of that hard work. Um, but I have to say that my position, as I'm sure I've made pretty clear thus far, is it really seems like we are treating <laughs> two very similar things very differently and that um, perhaps there is some element of political motivation that is going into the decisions that are being made here, which I find to be quite a disappointment. Um, so, you know, at this point, I'm, I'm just a bit perplexed that we've spent so many hours debating something that should be a pretty straightforward measure, um, specifically in the one from Metro Council. This is not the first time we've received a resolution from Metro Council to appear on the ballot. It has always been done in the same way. Um, it has come, you know, according to the opinion we've gotten from Metro Legal, it has met all the requirements. Um, even Professor Blumstein has not been able to say that it has not met um, any requirements for, you know, the method and, and the proper form for, for getting it to us. Um, the contents of it seem to be the concern. Um, I think we would all probably have written the for good government petition differently. We would have written the council resolution differently. I think 
We all, if we had a way to clean it up, we all probably would have. Um, but that's, that's not our role here. Our role here is to determine if it meets the qualifications to appear on the ballot. Um, and so given that today is the last day um, for the intention, what is the stated intention of the council resolution that it be on the ballot alongside the for good government petition for that specially called election. Um, I am going to make a motion that we approve the um, resolution submitted by the council and um, have that put on the ballot for uh, the special election that we called at the last meeting in July. Any, any Anyone else want to discuss that issue? I do. I, I think okay. a second is, I think that the second and then discussion is the way the rules work. Okay. No, because so, we, so we second so it, then I thought we were for ready for discussion. Or just this discussion. We were discussing generally, and, and then I made, a, I made a motion, and I think the way the rules work is when you make a motion, then there's a second, and then there's further discussion. All right, Ms. Hertzfeld, you, well, well, you asked for discussion. I did. And with the floor was open for discussion. Then I made a motion. All right, so you, you do not want to permit anybody to discuss your motion. No, I, I want everybody to discuss my motion. I want an opportunity for a second. So you don't want, you want to cut off, do you want to cut off discussion? No. Okay, so after the second, you'll, you'll permit discussion. Absolutely. I okay. think that's, I, I think, that's, that's, I think that's, that's absolutely that's appropriate. Fine. But I don't think that's following Robert's rules of order either. Well, I, 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 as long as we get discussion, I'm absolutely. not Absolutely. I'm not, gonna, I'm I'm not, not trying to cut off discussion. Okay. I get right. A second. And, and right. I think that is Robert's rules of order. If you make a motion, you get a second, then you have to but she's trying right. to second the issue to vote on it. That's the issue, and there's All no right. discussion. The only right. thing that's left is, a, is the All question. Right. Let me, okay. Uh, we, we do have a motion and a second, but the floor is open for discussion. Uh, anybody want to discuss that? Um, in regards to the issues at hand, um, I am by far, and I think we're all here, is not here to deny anyone the vote. Uh, my concern is in regards to the petition, so excuse me, the, the uh, 837, is that did they even, according to Metro Legal, of course, is what they've said, but I keep seeing this issue of 80 days in regards to the issue of the filing and things of that nature, and it came up in the last meeting as well uh, from Holland, I believe. So my question is, and I think the other issue that came up in the last meeting was, was it a filing or was it a motion or was it, you know, that, that issue came up. So my first question is before I think we should vote on it, can we get some clarity to the 80 day issue as well as to did Metro file it correctly under their own terms under the 80 days? Mr. Evans, do you have any any points of discussion? Okay. Um, let me. I, I think there's a lot I, I'd like to say about that. Okay. Go ahead. So, with the first sorry with the first lawsuit and petition back last year. Right. So the decision to uh, I guess. Um, do a declare what is it called declaratory, declaratory judgment. judgment I mean how did you guys arrive at that decision <laughs> we had a lengthy discussion concerning it uh, there was an issue about whether or not it was appropriate and it was ultimately decided that legally it was appropriate and it's my recollection that uh, this is one of the instances where Commissioner Hertzfeld and I agreed and we were both uncomfortable with the idea of suing a citizens group. Mm -hmm. And then I also thought that we were just kicking the can down the road because we would have to take a legal position on all these issues anyway. And I would, I, I would also remind everybody that we were not represented by counsel at that point. We did not have our own lawyers. So that decision was made you know, just before we, we had counsel. And that, uh, if I recall, I don't mean to interrupt you, but if I recall, I think you and I actually both voted against it. Yes. I think every, the other three members voted for it and you and I actually were yes. aligned in voting against it. A lot it. of people were, uh, a lot of people had heart attacks over that. <laughs> it happens from time to time. Yes. Okay. Um, so that's, that's a short, 
version of, of what happened. But, but that was based at that time, that was before we had counsel. And um, so that's, that's the history. From there, the litigation started. Um, Mr. Chairman. Yes, sir. And I guess I'm you're being a non-lawyer here. And if, if we were to set the election and the for good government uh, petition goes on, the referendum goes on, and not the council's resolution, does that mean that the council could come back a month later and have the resolution voted on again at another particular time? Well, well I don't think there's any, we, we can't, just like Metro couldn't keep good for government from right. submitting another petition so right. long as it, it so, long, so long as they didn't do, do so too many times, and I think there's some limits in the law on that, by the same token, Metro Council can come back and resubmit as long as they do it within the confines of the law. And there's some limitations on the number of times and, and, and uh, the number of times they can do that during a consulmatic term, I believe. So, so, so possibly that could be two elections. You could have one in July, and you can have one again in October. Yes, and 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 I think everybody wants to Only. avoid that if possible, because yeah. just because of the monetary aspect. Absolutely, but, absolutely. But you know, you look at that, and you see there are billions of dollars involved with these issues. It's not just millions of dollars involved, and so that's there's there's a little bit different context here than in our usual case. So yeah, yeah. But, but that's your, I mean, you raise a good point. Um, I, I've got, has ever, are, yes, are you sir, done? I've, I'm sorry. I've got some comments here. And, uh, you know, we, we can only deal the hand that's dealt us. And uh, we've, the hand that's dealt us is that we did put, and I think, I think because of the law, we put the good for government petition through the test of litigation last year. And our lawyers tell us, and I believe they have a good point when they tell us that uh, the good for government people have resubmitted their petition. They've responded to the criticisms of the court. So that's, so, so that's what we have in front of us. And it, I mean, our lawyers tell us, and I think we can read it, and it says on the top and on the bottom, these are six separate amendments. They just are. And then the law tells us that it's, it's a sufficient referendum petition if it's in the form that the voter can vote yes or no. It doesn't say you have to have the box next to it when you submit the petition. It just has to be in a form that you can break it down so the voters can vote on it, yes or no. And, and that's what the court, I think, told the good for government petition. And, it, you know, it cost, it cost uh, Metro and it cost the good for government people a lot of money to get to that point. But that's, that's where we are. That's where we got to. Yes, uh, Professor Blumstein. Yeah, I, I would like to uh, ask uh, Mr. McMullen to respond to Commissioner Davis's issue okay. about 80 days. I, it just kind of flew over my head, but he caught it, and, and I've urged him to try to respond, Commissioner, to your request. So if you don't mind, I'd like I'd like to ask you to recognize... As long as, long as I can well, reclaim well, reclaim well, my position. No, no, let, let him finish it now. Okay, is that okay? I mean, yeah. we, I think the answer. I just the, want to be sure. I think the question Mr. needs Davis to be answered. Has responded to, and 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 Mr. McMullen had a response. So I want to be sure that that question just doesn't go off into the ether. Mr. Somewhere. Davis thought I was on a roll. I guess. Yes. Thank you. I appreciate it. Okay, um, and 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 the 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 Metro Council Resolution Eight Thirty Seven, however doesn't say these are six separate uh, resolutions. In fact, it says it's, it's one amendment and 
and Councilman Mendez told us it was one amendment, which is almost exactly the same thing as what Mr. Roberts told us last year, if you recall. I asked him the same question, and he said, no, it's one amendment all or none, up or down, and that's exactly what Mr. Mendez told us the other day. So yes, we're comparing apples to oranges in the sense that, uh, the, the, uh, that what we're looking at is a Metro Council resolution that's pretty much in the same position that the good for government people were in a year ago. And we're in pretty much the same position we are, we were a year ago with the good for government people, except we're in a in that similar position with the Metro Council resolution. And that resulted in a declaratory judgment. And, and I, I don't think it's fair to start throwing around claims that everybody's politically motivated. I think everybody's looking at these and we're dealing with the hand uh, that's been dealt us and we're dealing with position papers from Metro. They're not our lawyers. They have a conflict. They admitted that last year. They still have a conflict. They, they retained what were our lawyers until, until they were retained by Metro to issue a position paper that was stated to be uh, an independent opinion sent to us, but it was a position paper. It's adversarial. We hired our own lawyers. They may not be telling us everything that we want to hear, <laughs> I mean, uh, but they're giving us, I think, an objective opinion on, on the law. And they're not, they're not saying, as these position papers have, that you know, it's 100% this way, like what we heard. We've heard that. Or they're not saying it's 100% that way. They're giving us a fair, objective opinion. Uh, and they've worked really hard on this under time constraints. And we got a letter from, from Mr. Cooper today, and he pretty much just, just said, we're not under time constraints, but we are. We couldn't, we couldn't do a thing with this Metro Resolution 837 until it was certified to us. And it wasn't certified to us till April 7th. Now, I don't know why Metro waited 17 days to get it to us. I assume that was a mistake. But, but, but that's the way it happened. You know, it's not, uh, it doesn't have to be anybody's fault. We didn't get it in a legal way until Friday. And here it is six days later, and our lawyers have been working really, really hard to give us an objective opinion. They're not politically motivated. They're giving us their best effort at what the law is. And that's what we have to, that's what we have to deal with. And, and we have to also look at the Metro resolution. It's confusing. I presented that, I sent this to four lawyers who are experts on metropolitan law and they can't understand it. Uh, you know, I, I've, I've talked to them, I showed it to them, I called them back. This is over a hundred years of experience as lawyers and th these are lawyers, they can't understand it. We're asking a, the taxpayer to go in there who's he's not going to have a lawyer at his shoulder. He's not going to have Professor Blumstein or Bob Cooper or anybody sitting in the ballot box with him to tell him what he's reading and trying to explain it to him. He's going to come in after working and he's going to come in and he's going to, he's going to, he should be able to look on the ballot and make his decision. He shouldn't have to you know, read the charter. He shouldn't have to do all this research. It's got to be clear enough for him to understand it. And I can see two places in there. I hope it's not intentional, but at least two places where there's a trap set. There's a trap set for the voter. Well, he's not going to have any idea why he's voting. And at this point, we don't know. And you, I, I asked uh, Mr. Cooper, the last time we were here, are they going to give us a summary that maybe does a better job of what Metro's summary does? And he didn't give me an answer. And he wrote us a, you know, a nice letter, but the question still stands, are you going to give us a summary that helps us? And we don't have it. It's required by state law, in my opinion. There's a state law that clears a bell. That's the, the charter tells uh, city council, they have to do the summary, but state law says that the Metro attorney has to do a summary and it's supposed to clarify, not obfuscate. 
and the obfuscation issue is real. It's just real. I don't know what that thing says. And, and I don't think we can expect a voter uh, who doesn't have 40 years of experience as a lawyer to understand it any better than I can. So I, I just think that it, the, the right thing to do in fairness is to take it to the court. We've ar we're already in court. We've got a good chancellor there. We've got good lawyers. And I think on issues like these, that is the best, that's the best chance we've got. And, uh, you, know, I'm, uh, you know, I'm a lawyer, but that's why we have courts. Uh, so, you know, I think everybody here is trying to do the best they can with the hand we've been dealt. Um, and that's our job to do. So I think, I think the fairest thing we can do, and I'm going to have a motion, but I, I so I don't want to start arguing a motion that hasn't isn't before, before us. But uh, I, I can't vote for putting this on the ballot because I just think it'd be a horrible mess. And whether that was done purposefully or not, I hope it wasn't. But I think the, I think since our authority is is not clear on some of these issues that we would just be better off, especially since we've already been sued, with taking it to court. And that is my reason for, uh, even though we haven't voted yet, for signaling that I, you know, I'm, I'm going to vote against that. Uh, is there any other comment? Oh, I'm sorry. Yes, yeah. yes. Sir. That's why I wanted to let you roll. Absolutely. <laughs> Mr. Chairman, I did want to respond to Commissioner Davis's question, which I understood to basically be, does the Metro Council resolution have an 80-day problem under Section 19.01? And I think there is a, a calculation that can be made in which the Metro Council resolution would not meet the 80-day period under Section 19.01. I would remind you of the advice that you heard from Professor Blumstein, which was he said the only recommendation that, that we were presenting was to not place this on the ballot. Um, and I think that calculation would be consistent with that advice. Now, we're not necessarily taking the position that the 80-day provision in Section 1901 is the controlling provision about dates. There is state law on that as well. Um, but there is a calculation that can be made uh, based on the date that's in the Metro Council resolution that would not meet the 80 days. That issue will come up in litigation. It, it will, that is an issue that has been raised in the litigation already um, and, and I'm sure will be a litigated issue with respect to the For Good Government petition. Thank you. Is there any other discussion? What, yes, sir. What is the timetable on the litigation? Well, it, I think we're going to get a report uh, from our lawyers. Uh, I don't think we know yet. There are two status conferences set for tomorrow, and I think our lawyers are going to talk to us about that. Both cases have been set for status conferences. They actually were set for can status conferences today, but those have been put off till Friday. So, is, is that... Yeah, I was just trying to figure out where these lawsuits are. I mean, and there's, uh, other than the status conferences, I don't think anything's been set. One other thing. Yes, sir. Could these lawsuits... I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Could these lawsuits stop us proceeding forward? Well, Could they, yeah. He put a junction on and said no election. They, they could. I mean, yeah, they definitely could. That's what happened. If you remember, that's what happened last year. Mm -hmm. We were proceeding forward. We had a date for an election, and Chancellor Lyle issued an order saying we're not going to have the election. Basically, did you want to you want to refine that, uh, Professor Blumstein? You know, Mr. McMullen is w at the appropriate time on the agenda. Mm -hmm. We'll be reporting this. We we don't. It's it's premature. I just want to make the point 
that the posture of the case last year is different than the posture of the case this year, uh, at least with respect to the for good government. With respect to for good government last year, the commission said, we, we don't take a position. We're asking, invoking the authority of the court. And basically, it was Chancellor Lyle who made the decision. The posture this year is different. The commission has recommended that the vote go forward on the for good government. And uh, so therefore, the, the, the posture is different. With respect to the metro ordinance, it depends what you all vote now. But if you decide to have a declaratory judgment action, then that would be in the posture that the case was in last year. But with respect to the for good government, it's a different posture. The commission has gone forward, and ultimately right. the court will determine whether the commission was within its rights uh, to act as it did. Okay. Thank you. I, I didn't Sir. mean to interrupt. No, you're not. You're not interrupting. No. All right. Is there any further discussion on the pending motion? No. All right. If if uh, there's no further discussion, we have a motion and a second. All in favor, say aye. 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 All, aye. Oppo all opposed, say nay. 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 Uh, the motion does not carry. Commissioners Hertzfeld and Starling voted yes, and Commissioners Davis, Evans, and Delanis voted no. Uh, is there any further discussion at this point? I have, I have some discussion, but I, I want to defer to my uh, fellow commissioners if they have something to say. But I, okay. Um, I think our lawyers ha have raised legitimate concerns in two areas. I mean, very definite concerns that I share about the, uh, you know, about the, the Metro 837 resolution. They've also raised, I would not say it would be concerns, but at least some caution about the level of our authority. You know, it's, it remains a bit unclear what our authority is opposed, as opposed to what is the court's authority. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I have strong opinions about the Metro 837 resolution. I've asked questions. Uh, to uh, Councilman Mendez uh, that he wasn't able to answer about things that I didn't understand about it. So evidently the proponents of this don't, you know, they, they don't understand all the ramifications of it also. As I mentioned earlier, I've asked a, a series of, of lawyers who I consider to be experts in the area of metropolitan law. They don't understand it. Uh, we got a letter today from Mr. Cooper at 3 o'clock presenting his legal position. So that kind of tells you the, the time frames. We, we may quibble about, gee, you know, is it, is it really, are we really under the gun here? But we're getting the legal positions of Metro on this. It, it, I got it at 3 o'clock today. It was probably sent to us closer to midday. I didn't see it until 3 o'clock. Uh, it doesn't particularly help us in understanding uh, what's in this uh, 837. It says some things about what it doesn't. It says it doesn't mean this and it doesn't mean that, but it really says nothing about what it is intended to do. What are these provisions intended to do? Uh, we don't know. I, I, as I understand it, in the, based on the questions I asked Mr. Cooper, he had not given an opinion on, on this Metro 837 um, resolution as of Monday, April 10th. So, um, but now he has, you know, he's written us this letter, but it's not particularly helpful. Uh, I think that we as a commission, if there's one thing that that we need to do is to give the voter a clear and understandable ballot. That I think is the is the key on this issue. Uh, while I think we would hope to avoid expensive and protracted litigation, we're already in litigation, and hopefully, when we're in litigation, 
we can, <laughs> as a result of that, achieve for the voter what it should be our goal, which is to give the voter a clear and understandable vote, a choice, so that the, the voter, who's not a lawyer, can understand what he's being asked to vote on. Uh, and, and so I come up with a potential motion that I think will do a couple of things. Uh, one is to give the public, so the public knows what our goals are, because you know you hear a lot of you hear a lot of things. Um, you know, I have had people come to me and say that he thinks we're in cahoots with with the metro government. Uh, I hear that a lot. I try to explain to them that we're an independent body. We're a state agency that's, while it's funded by Metro, we're still a state agency and we have a, a balance of Republicans and Democrats on, on the commission so that it is unlikely that we would be in cahoots with Metro. Uh, but nonetheless, there's, I think, some misunderstanding out there. So here's my suggestion, I'll scratch this out here, and, and that is uh, a motion that would state as follows. We direct our attorneys to seek a declaration in the existing litigation against us concerning Metro Resolution 837 in order to defend the commission's authority and to provide the voter with a clear and understandable ballot and we request Metro and the Metro Council to revise 837 to make it clear and understandable. So I think that would combine some of the elements that Professor Blumstein has given us, in other words, to try to you know, present to Metro at least the, the idea that we're, re we're receptive to the fact that, and we know Metro has the, Metro Council has the right to present these. And, and, you know, we, we, we accept that. We don't challenge that at all. Uh, and we're receptive to their ability to do that. Um, but I think in view of the fact that we're already in court and we're, you know, that's where we are, that we would be better off in, in, uh, in presenting it within the, within the confines of litigation unless you know, obviously, if Metro does decide to revise this 837, then they would be like, you know, just, just like the good for government people, they'd be taking a, a second approach to it. So I think we would be treating them both equally. So that's my, that's my pitch. Any, any comment, question? Was, was that your motion? That was my, that, that was my motion with an explanation for it. And I've, I've written it down if everybody, anybody wants to look at it. Very thoroughly written, but yeah, that'd be helpful sure. for the notes. Yes. Thank you. Yes. Okay. Is, is there any discussion? I, I think you need a second first, is right. how we had done the last one, okay. just to be consistent. Is there a second? A second. We have a second by Mr. Davis. Is there any discussion? Just to be clear for the notes, was that second Davis or was it Mr. Evans? Mr. I'm Evans. Sorry. Okay, that's okay. okay. Just me. wanted to be clear. Okay. Just so right. we're we're good for the notes when we sure. have them for for yes. next week. Don't worry, we look alike. <laughs> um, the the motion in, in your statement is, is for and what Mr. Bernstein said we want to do was suggesting for. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm just sitting back. Uh, was it similar to what Professor Blumstein was suggesting on uh, sending, uh, sending a letter? Well, I mean, it, it, wouldn't, be in the, it wouldn't be in the form of a letter. Yeah. Because I, I agree there is, I think there is an issue for do we sit down and negotiate with people every time they have a resolution and then, and then it puts us in a kind of a conflict situation when it comes to us in a formal way and we have to rule on it when we've already negotiated with them, if you see what I mean. And that's mm -hmm. where we've had some hesitation in the past. This, this would be similar in the sense that we're, we're making a public statement that we're, you know, 
we're receptive to proposals from me the metro government. It's not we're not trying to, you know, we're not trying to to uh, discourage them from doing that. But it just says that you know we think this one this one could stand another look, basically. And and again, it's the whole issue, in, at least in my opinion, and in this motion is to make it clear and understandable to the voter. Thank you. I'm, um, I'm concerned about a lot of things, but my motion failed. So, um, you know, at this point, I'm concerned about the additional cost in drafting a, a deck action. I think that's, I mean, I've done it, and I've done it on a quick turnaround. It takes a lot of time. It takes a lot of effort by the lawyers. We're paying these lawyers by the hour. Um, we're already involved in litigation, so if there's going to be you know, an amended petition or an amended lawsuit that's going to include our vote today where we voted down a council resolution. I think that is a much more efficient way to deal with the issue if Metro were to amend it, which I'm sure they will, um, for us to just add that into the defense that we already have versus taking undertaking the cost and expense, time and effort of the lawyers to put together um, what would definitely be in very short order a declaratory judgment action. So you. Um, for financial reasons, specifically among others, um, I intend to vote no. Okay. All right. Um, to, to respond to your concerns, if I may, w last year we filed a deck action, mm -hmm. and we were paying private lawyers for that. Mm -hmm. And also, I mean, it all comes out of the same pocket. I know, you know, the Metro Legal Department is is going to prepare it and perhaps they're all on salaries, but it's still there's some expense there and we would have to respond to it. Uh, so, so the fact that we did this last year and it, you know, it was not a, it didn't, it didn't break Metro. And I would remind everybody, I, I know we are all concerned about expense and we should be, but this is a billion dollar issue, at least, at least a billion dollar issue. And I, I think I'm consistent in my position because I voted against it the last time as well. So yes. I'll, I'll stay yes. consistent in that position. Yes, uh, kudos on that. And any other discussion points? All right, we, we, have a, we have then a motion and a second. All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed say nay. 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 Uh, with with that, we have three, four, two against. The motion carries. Commissioners Davis, Evans, and Delanis voting yes, and Commissioners uh, Starling and Hertzfeld voting no. Uh, the next item on the agenda is to approve the early voting schedule and locations <laughs> for the July 27th referendum. Uh, it seems to be similar to what we've done in the past, but I do think this is perhaps something that the staff should should explain to us while we're looking at it, if that's acceptable. Mr. Chairman, yes, the, the draft schedule that we provided to you mimics what we did pretty much in August of 2020. For an election of this anticipated size, we would have Howard early voting open for the full uh, early voting period, and then we would have the satellite sites open up one week later. Not here, just, just Howard is our standard early voting site, and then we would have the other sites the libraries and such, they would open up the following week. Okay. Fine. Mr. Chairman? Yes, ma'am. And we've stayed consistent with our um, later evenings on Tuesdays and Thursdays, keeping it open until 7? Correct. We're trying to stick so that the voters have an expectation. They have a general idea of, you know, when early voting is every, for every election which is why we try to keep our elections on Tuesdays or Thursdays and our late evenings and kind of keep everything consistent year after that, year. That's correct. Okay, I appreciate that. Thank you. Any further questions or discussion concerning the early voting schedule? Yes, sir. Well, is this 
probably not concerning the schedule. I was just wondering about the COVID protocol. I have uh, sent an email to uh, Dr. Wright at the health department. His email back to me says that he is anticipating that we would be outside of COVID protocol okay. by July the 27th. Of course, there's some caveats there that, you know, everything is a little unpredictable around COVID. So, uh, but that's the game plan right now. Yes, ma'am. And I think during the presidential, we had one additional early voting location that was the friendship location. Is that right? Traditionally, four presidential elections, we have had the friendship uh, as an additional site. But since this is not a presidential, we have not included it uh, in this election. Okay. And that's consistent with our previous practice? Correct. Okay. Thank you. Question. And just, just uh, you know, new to the game here. So with the issue that AJ brought up, um, Commissioner Sterling, so are we also being prepared for potentially having to go back into COVID protocol and doing the same at the same time? Correct. We're, we're planning kind of just in case. Uh, so for PPE equipment, those kind of things, we will try to be prepared to go each, each way. I mean, it's, we don't think it's going to be one of those things that will happen overnight. It's going to be, you know, something that we can kind of expect a little bit. So um, when we start packing up the equipment to go to the polling locations, we will have a, a pretty good idea of what scenario we're going to be under at the time. Any other questions or discussion? Motion to approve early voting locations and times and dates as set out by the staff in the proposal presented to us. I'll second. We have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 <clears throat> aye. Any opposition? With no opposition, the motion carries unanimously. Uh, next on the agenda is item five, scheduling the locking of provisional bags, boxes, and absentee bins. I'm sorry, if I forgot, I'm sorry, I forgot. Number four comes first. Uh, approve poll officials for the July 27th referendum. As has been your practice uh, for past elections, we ask you to approve all of our active poll officials so that we can have a large pool to pull from in the event of let's say COVID gets a little wild and crazy on us. We have backup ready to go at that point in time. So as in the past, we'd like for you to prove all of our active poll officials as part of the pool that we could choose from. Mr. Chairman, make a motion that we approve all active uh, poll officials. All right, we have a motion and a second. Is there any further discussion? With no further discussion, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposition? With no opposition, the motion carries unanimously. Yes, oh, ma'am. I'm sorry. Who did the second? I don't think you had a second. Uh oh. <laughs> do I do it again? I thought yeah. you. I thought you. You made the motion, and Mr. Starling mm -hmm. made the second. Mr. Made the Starling motion. made the motion. Let's With try nobody it again. Second. <laughs> okay. Mr. Starling made the motion. I will second. All right. We ha we now have a motion and a second. All in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposition? With no opposition, the motion carries unanimously. Thank you. Uh, we are now at uh, item f five, schedule locking of provisional bags and boxes and absentee bins. With that, since we are streaming, uh, could you give us an explanation for that? Uh, AOE Roberts, what in, a, in probably a more specific way than we usually do, what, what is it that we're being asked to address here? So for provisional votes that are out there uh, on election day or during early voting, we have bags that must be locked. Each bag has a Republican and a Democratic lock. They also have a, a separate seal, numbered seal. Those numbers are reported to the state. 
we have to have those locked ahead of time so that we can load them on the carts that go out to the election. It's more of a logistical piece on the uh, provisional bags. The absentee ballot bins and boxes, we need those locked prior to the point where we will start receiving back absentee ballot, actual ballots. They are locked in a similar fashion as the provisional bags. Two locks, two seals, um, one Democrat, one Republican. So it's all in preparation to make sure we can maintain the security of every vote that we receive. And, and, uh, and then one of the commissioners who's a Democrat and one of the commissioners who's a Republican, they're, they're personally involved in that. That's um, correct. Ev every single box and every single bag. They, they actually have the keys to do those um, openings uh, right. of those particular items. Okay. So the key, the key is we need to have this finished, accomplished prior to June the 12th because we will be, based on the July 27th election date, we will be sending out military ballots. That's the deadline for us to have those out. So okay. that we need to have all of the bins and bags locked prior to that time. All right. Does the staff have a recommendation for the date uh, for locking of provisional bags, boxes, and absentee bins? Let me ask Ms. Mott if you have a, a, a current time frame based on your schedule as to when, you know, what would work best for you. It must be done before the 12th of June. I prefer to be done on a business schedule. Mm -hmm. Sure. Right. And for the two new commissioners, uh, I will more than likely be the Democrat person because I've done it over the years. And I, thanks, Trish. <laughs> so it, it just uh, whichever one of you all do it. Normally we do it through the week. Uh, you know, it could vary. We try not to do it in the afternoon because the staff want to go ahead. It's, the process takes about an hour, hour and a half if we, if we go through it pretty quickly. It's, uh, it's tedious. Now we have to lock and unlock. And so that's part of it as well. And you'll be the keeper of the key, the keys uh, for those boxes. So it's, uh, it's not the most glamorous job in the world, but uh, it's something that has to be done. And uh, I've done it over many, many years. So well, I will let you. I know the well, chairman. The chairman and I have both done. Right, it. Yeah. we do that a lot. But what's your schedule like during that? Oh, uh, my schedule. Period? I'll make make it happen. Uh, normally, uh, I'm I'm open. Okay, okay. Well, then we can actually set that date now. Uh, um, I'm good. Any time other than. Uh, the 26th through the through Memorial Day week, I'm leaving town. But I, we want, I would like to see what your schedule is. Yeah, I'm, I'm available starting June 1st. Starting June the 1st? Yeah, I'm going to be out that week of the 24th to the 28th. Okay, yeah, I'll, I'll be out too, so 26th through the 31st. Anytime when you first saw it, I'm there. Uh, Courtney, we, we're discussing June the 1st. Is that? June 1st? I'm here at 7 every morning. Okay. Seven. <laughs> you don't okay. have to, you don't you don't have have to, to do 7. seven. But, uh, <laughs> She'll be here all day. <laughs> what I signed up for. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I'm, I'm fine with June the 1st as well. Uh, Eight o'clock, eight or nine, which eight, is that fine, Courtney? I got it. Okay, June 1st, eight o'clock, okay. You come here? Come here. Come here, yeah. And Courtney, if you 
could just send a reminder to both of us just okay thank you okay all right okay. i don't think there's nothing further on that we can go to the aoe report mr chairman um we're preparing for the election uh for july 27th staff uh, met this week out at the warehouse um, following up on Mr. Davis's concerns just in case we had to do COVID they've looked at uh, the status of our supplies what we've got what we might need to be thinking about ordering I think we've uh, already got prepared an order for some uh, hand sanitizer that we were lacking on so staff is gearing up at this point to move toward a July 27th election. That's pretty much all I can uh, give you for tonight. Um, we're, uh, folks are ready to go. Okay, any questions? All right. We are at the public comment time, unless there's anything under the AOE report, and I gather there's not. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I think you'd wanted to Oh, uh, I'm sorry. During yeah, the we, AOE, AOE let report, the we need a council speak. Exactly, to we need a report from council, uh, a public report on the status of the litigation. Yes, Mr. McMullen, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I realize the hour and where we are on the agenda, so I'll be brief. Um, on May 11th, two lawsuits were filed against the election commission. Both were filed in the Davidson County Chancery Court. One was filed on behalf of the Metropolitan Government, Mayor John Cooper and the Finance Director, Kevin Crumbo, represented by the Metro Department of Law. The other was filed by the Nashville Business Coalition, represented by Jamie Holland. Both suits challenge the Election Commission's decision to place the four <laughs> good government proposed amendments on the ballot. Uh, Professor Blumstein and I have previously sent the commissioners um, a privileged review of how we believe a court will likely analyze these issues. Uh, both uh, cases are currently pending before Chancellor Russell Perkins. There are scheduling conferences set for tomorrow in both cases, uh, and the Nashville Business Coalition has filed a motion to consolidate the two cases. Uh, I'm, I assume that when we are there tomorrow, we will uh, receive some type of schedule as far as how the litigation will proceed uh, and we will work from that going forward. What time is the scheduling conference tomorrow Mr. McMillan? The scheduling conference in the lawsuit filed by the Metropolitan Government is at 11:30 a.m. The scheduling conference in the lawsuit filed by the Nashville Business Coalition is at 2 30 p.m. Do you know if those are in person or by Zoom? The scheduling conference in the lawsuit filed by the Metropolitan Government is in person. The scheduling conference in the lawsuit filed by the National Business Coalition is by telephone. Okay, great, thank you so much. You're welcome. Uh, th this is somewhat related. Uh, in one of our earlier meetings, we talked about making some things a matter of the record. and I, I think Ms. Hertzfeld, you may have been the one that that gave the list. I'm not positive, but we included in that list uh, Professor Blumstein's opinion uh, letter to us on the numerosity issue. And I'm suggesting that since we're in litigation, it might be wise to not immediately, but at some point in time ask our lawyers to prepare a public version of that document and then maintain the privilege as to the document that the, the entire document that was sent to us is that acceptable with everybody i i don't want to be in a position where anybody claims we've waived the privilege by turning over uh, a, a privileged document. Is that a decision that needs to be made right now, do you think? It does I don't think it has to be. Uh, it, do you think that's something that needs to be put on the agenda? No, 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 no. I just, my concern is preparing a, another version of something again at an hourly rate. It's going to, you know, 
I, I guess how long do you think it would take? It was a it was a pretty short thing. It, you're not talking about a ton of time to prepare something in a public version, right? The numerosity memo. Y yeah. You could do a summary, probably of a page. I can't imagine that would take right. an incredibly long. time. I think you could just cut and paste. Okay. So long as we keep it within reason, there's a reason to, to make sure. that information public. So I'm fine with that. Okay, thank you. All right, we are, I think, to the public comment period. There's a Nicole Williams. Ms. Williams, you're welcome to speak to us. Uh, ordinarily, we will limit that to one minute. Yes, uh, Ms. Williams. Hi, thank you so much. Could I have a minute and a half? Yeah. Yes. Great. Thank you so much. Okay. Um, my name is Nicole Williams. I live in Davidson County. Um, in my comments last month, I cautioned the commission against making a decision that would call into question your impartiality. I guess y'all weren't listening because Monday night and tonight are just blatantly partisan displays. I've heard some pretty laughable assertions. Um, so I just want to level set here because I'm kind of sick of the pretense and I suspect that I'm not the only one. You all are an unelected body deliberately slow walking a proposed charter amendment supported by all 40 members of our elected body because it doesn't align with your political views. Um, I also just want to note that Chair Delanis, you refer to the commission as a balanced body. You're not a balanced body. You have an insurmountable majority that tracks with the comp composition of the state legislature, regardless of the composition of Davidson County, and that is by design. So the best that we can hope for, the very best that we can hope for, is something that vaguely resembles neutrality if you squint your eyes and cock your head to the side a little. And the majority of you are not even trying to pretend at this point. Um, I don't know what's happened to this body, but it's just really upsetting to watch. And I hope that something changes soon. Thank you. Councilman Mendez. Thanks, Chair. Um, during the extended comments from Council, he referred to the Metro Council as a governmental unit, which of course is incorrect. Um, the Metro Council is an entire branch of this government, um, popularly elected by the people. Um, at the last election in 2019, I received the most votes out of everybody in the Metro Council. I represent all 500 square miles, all 700,000 people in this county. I expressly ran on the platform of raising the property tax rate to pay for what this city needs to pay for after having taken that move in the council two times. That's the context for these comments. As the only countywide elected person in the room, I want to say clearly that what's been going on at the last couple meetings, what you guys are doing, is pre-baked political theater designed to feed um, apparently the ambitions of a small percentage of the county. Um, all the choices presented to you today um, under the cover of, you know, smart Vanderbilt professor were to keep it off the ballot. That was the only choice presented to you and it ignores Metro Council, Metro Legal and historic precedent about way, the way council um, uh, ballot petitions go. Um, this is not the way, it's not fair, it's anti-democratic and um, uh, even your own council couldn't tell you that it's not legal to put on the ballot repeatedly, they said, I'm not saying that this position is right. I'm just saying if you did it, it would be defensible. Literally, that's the best they could give on the legal advice. It's like, I'm not, I'm definitely not saying it's right, but it's, you know, if you want to do it, it's defensible. That's a sham. You all know it's a sham. And I'm here to tell you guys, you might get away with it tonight, but we see you, we see what you're doing, and it's not going to stand one way or the other. There's no chance of it being taken as collegial to send a letter to dismiss what the popularly elected body passed 40 to zero with Metro Legal and the council director signing off on it and matching historical precedent. We see what's going on and you shouldn't do it. Uh, Mr. Garrett, do you have a public comment? Good evening, and again, I wish to thank you guys for all that you do. Uh, I did not have, sir, until I heard your testimony, and there's just a couple things that I wish to clarify. Uh, you talked about a group
group called the Good for Government, and I think Jim Roberts' group is For Good Government, and I'd like to make sure that your minutes reflect the proper name for that organization, For Good Government. And twice in your comments, you've talked about the certification of the council thing to you on April the 7th, and that the Attorney General Cooper, or Attorney Cooper, making a comment on April the 10th, that he had not made a comment on April the 10th. I just want to make sure you're referring to the month of May. Okay, thank you. That, I appreciate that. All right. Uh, we've heard all the public comments. We're at uh, item eight, which is to set the time and date of the next meeting. Uh, is, uh, is there something we need to do, uh, Mr. Roberts, by a certain time? Uh, I, one thing that comes to mind, have we, have we gone through the, the registrations this quarter, and do we need to set a meeting to do that? You would have to uh, have another meeting prior to June 30 to review the uh, registration cards, and I feel confident we'll, okay. we'll have another one prior to that time. All right, okay. I'm happy to do a meeting at the call of the chair. Okay. I'm certain something will come up between now and then that will necessitate another meeting. Okay, all right, good. Uh, if, if that's the sense of the commission, we are at, at the stage to adjourn. Do we have a motion? You do, a motion to adjourn. Second. We have a motion and a second. All in favor say aye. 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 Without opposition, the motion carries. Thank you all. This has been a service of the Metro National Network. If you would like to see this presentation again, or for more information about this and other programs, visit nashville.gov.